Um, and just to sort of lay the um, groundwork, I think, for today's session, um, myself and, and Dr. Peter Entwistle will be presenting. Um, we're just going to go through a few slides, which Peter is going to um, run, run through with us initially. Um, if you have questions, if you could um, put them, place them into the chat box, we will um, I think the first few slides will probably be about 10, 15 minutes, just to give I uh, guess a little bit of background information um, to some of the, the changes with Bailey 4, which some may be familiar with, some may, may be less familiar with. Um, and then we will run through a live Q&A, so um, please throw your questions in there and we'll attempt to address them all. Any that we are unable to address, we will make sure we respond afterwards, but hopefully we'll be able to address them all. So um, without um, any further ado, I'd like to pass you on to Dr. Peter Entwistle. Peter. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. And good morning to those of you who are in other parts of the States. Uh, just for your information, Shelley is joining us from the UK today, and so there's a significant time difference between uh, here, where I am in Washington, D.C., and where she is in the north of England. So welcome, everybody. I know some of you may have been expecting to see or hear uh, Paul today, and I apologize he wasn't able to join us. I'm not exactly sure of the reason why, but hopefully we'll be able to cover the material that he was planning to cover for you. Some of you may know me. Uh, some of you may be aware that I provided training on the Bailey scales before, and sometimes that has been for pharmaceutical companies that use the Bailey in their research. Uh, some of you at universities have heard me present on the Bailey, and also some of you at hospitals around the country have heard me before. So I am one of the speakers, uh, along with Shelley and Gloria and others, that Pearson has to uh, inform you about this test. And as Shelley said, today the plan is for us to just do a quick overview for those of you who are really unfamiliar. But I see some f names up there that are of individuals who have attended previous uh, webinars, and I want to welcome you back, and hopefully we can get to some of the questions that you want to ask. I do know that in the past we have had a very active chat box and I look forward to seeing those questions uh, on the left-hand side of your screen as we're going along. So once again, welcome. We're going to do an overview of the Bailey, and also I'm going to provide a heads up about the screening test which is coming, and I think that may be of real interest uh, to a number of you. We'll talk about the administration options, and also how you can purchase different components uh, of the test that you may need. And we're going to focus a great deal on Q&A today. So write those questions in so we can answer them, and that way you won't leave feeling frustrated. So let's have a look at the timeline. The Bailey 4 has already published. That happened on September the 12th, so it's very recent, and in fact, a couple of days after that, I was with Glenn Aylwood at the Society for Developmental Pediatrics in DC, and so it's an exciting time to be around the test as it becomes available to everybody. On the 14th of September, uh, it was published in a digital format, so the first take-home message for some of you is that it's in more than one format. Some of you will be able to administer and score the test using the digital approach. Uh, some of you may prefer to use paper or perhaps a mixture. I do know that many of you probably want to see a paper manual even if you do decide that you want to start doing the digital scoring using Q Global. Uh, also, I want you to be aware that in November of 2019, uh, we will be publishing the screening test. And I know that's going to be very popular for some people that just want something shorter, quicker, easier perhaps to score that will provide a cutoff, and you're going to be able to get that on this test. Let's do a quick overview. What is the Bailey for? Well, it was intended to provide developmental assessment of infants and toddlers who may have a developmental delay so that we can then provide early intervention services to those children. So the first part, developmental assessment, it's intended to provide an assessment for children as young as two weeks all the way up to 42 months. 
and it is the most up-to-date assessment to do that. So infants and toddlers who possibly have a developmental delay may be referred, and so this can be done uh, by an early intervention program. It's an individually administered test, and it only assesses the developmental functioning. So bear in mind that we are going to be looking at a number of different domains and that you will need uh, to plan on spending time with the child. And in addition to that, you're going to get information from a parent or caregiver about how they view the child in a systematic and structured way. So there are five developmental domains. And for those of you that are familiar with the previous iterations of the Bailey, such as the Bailey 3, you know those include cognition, language, that would be receptive and expressive, motor, that would be fine and gross motor, and those are the areas that you're going to be evaluating one-on-one -on -one with the child. Or perhaps uh, you may have the parents support you, so in that case, obviously, it's two-on-one. Furthermore, you're going to be asking the parent to complete a checklist of questions about the child's adaptive functioning and their social-emotional growth. But one of the things you will find is that you'll be also asking the parent about whether the child has mastery of certain areas or has it been demonstrating skills. So 16 days to 42 months. These are the areas uh, that are evaluated by the uh, Bailey scales, and that's consistent with the earlier version of the Bailey 3. And this is what it looks like. The structure of the Bailey 4 will consist of a cognitive area, which will provide you with an overall score. Language composite score is comprised of the receptive and expressive area. So does the child understand what's being said to them? Do they comprehend what is being said? So they have to hear it. And then secondly, can they communicate what their needs or wishes or desires are? Can they express themselves? So you're looking at both aspects of that, uh, which we would refer to as the language composite. Uh, some of the tasks will require what we refer to as gross motor. And for those of you less familiar with that term, it would be such things as standing and balancing, walking. Whereas fine motor may involve more closely refined uh, coordination, such as uh, can the child grasp something, can they move something, can they hold on to something, and uh, can they use their eyes and hands uh, to achieve that. In addition, we're interested in knowing how does the child see the world around them and how do they feel, how do they respond to their environment, and so we ask the parents how they view the child and their social emotional status. And what we've known from many other studies, there are temperamental differences in children, and we may see that some children are much easier to manage and handle. I remember Sheldon White uh, teaching a class about three and four year olds at Harvard who was talking about just that thing. What is it that nannies and grandmas know about children? And what do cognitive psychologists know? And how can we incorporate some of that knowledge and understanding of the way the child comes into the world and how they experience those relationships and how they get their needs met and how they respond? So that's going to cover the social-emotional area. We're also going to see how does the child adapt to the environment that they're in. Are they able to communicate their needs? Are they able to perform certain tasks of daily living? Uh, for example, can they button things up or zip things? Uh, can they brush their teeth? Uh, can they dress? Can they put their shoes on? That sort of thing. And then lastly, we're going to look at their socialization. Uh, are they able to play with other children or on their own in isolation? And how do they get along with others? Uh, with parents, with siblings, with peers, with relatives? Uh, how do they function? And all of those areas are assessed by the adaptive behavior scale. Now, what were the goals? Do you just want to take the same test and update the norms, or do you want to revise it in some meaningful way that is valuable to individuals like you 
who may be psychologists or early childhood consultants that want to have a tool that you will like giving and using. So what we know is that the Bailey uh, has a great deal of support in the community and across the country. And a lot of people basically are saying, don't mess with that. Don't change it. It has lots of qualities to it that I really appreciate and I want to see and I want to have those maintained. But now there's a difference, and there's a new word for some of you, polytimus. And what that refers to is, instead of just saying, yes, it's right or wrong, can the child show mastery? Uh, is the skill emerging, or is it totally absent? So for example, I remember watching a child on the mat of the OTPT in a pediatric clinic and wanted to establish that the child was able to get from a lying down position to a standing position without support. And so the question was, were they able to do that? Or is this a skill that is slowly emerging, but they're not quite there yet? So we're going to use the term polytimus to refer to the fact that it's not just there or absent, it's does the child show mastery, which is a two-point is it emerging, one point, or is it totally absent, or they're unable to do it, zero. And what you'll see is there's an increasing, uh, let's say, cooperation with or collaboration with caregivers in the actual evaluation and scoring. So our, our task was to uh, see if we could simplify the test itself and reduce how long it takes to test children. Could we improve some of the content coverage and make sure it's age appropriate and up to date? That's always a task that uh, we're confronted with in producing psychological tests. Can we improve the clinical utility of the test for use with different clinical validity groups? So for example, can this be used with children that may have Down syndrome or who may have been born very early or with a very low birth weight? Or how about those children whose parents may have been engaged in substance abuse, such as an opioid addiction or perhaps alcohol and drug abuse? Can we use this test to evaluate some of those children? We want to make sure it's sensitive and it has some specificity to it. But in addition to that, we want to make sure that the data are up to date, that it reflects the US population census and that the norms are appropriate because they are up to date. So what kind of scores do you get? Well, you will be able to get scaled scores. You'll get composite scores and there will be percentile ranks and confidence intervals. Now for many areas, you'll be able to get something called a scaled score, which is a, a range from one to 19 where the mean is 10 the composite score is 100 with a standard deviation of 15. Furthermore, you'll be able to achieve something called a growth scale value where you can actually compare a child's performance against some earlier performance and see how much growth has occurred. So when you look at the subtests, cognition is both a scaled score and a composite score, but the receptive and expressive language components contribute to a composite for language. Fine and gross motor contribute to the overall motor composite, and so you're going to get composite scores for cognition, language, and motor. In addition to that, you'll have composite scores for the social emotional, adaptive, communication, daily living, and socialization areas. And as you can see, you're going to get a number of other uh, scores that you can use, including percentile ranks and confidence intervals and in the case of sensory processing, a cut score. So we're going to give you a lot of different scores. And one of the things I try to do when I have an audience is just to make sure that everybody understands how to interpret those findings. So there's going to be a screening test, which Shelley is going to go into in some detail and describe for you. But it's going to be a subset of items that are already on the uh, Bailey 4 in the cognition, language, and motor scales area. But please note that there is no social, emotional, or adaptive uh, behavior component on the screener. Instead of deriving composite or scaled scores, 
uh, you will have a cut score. So is the child at risk? Is there a possibility because there's a borderline risk? Or does this child really present a very low risk uh, in terms of their uh, score? So this is not intended to replace a more comprehensive assessment, nor is it intended for diagnostic decision-making about children, but it can prove to be very useful when time is of the essence. Now, how do you give this test? You're probably used to the previous test, which came in a big case, and thankfully it had wheels, but how do you administer and score this test. Is it the same? Well, let me go over that with you. There is a digital administration opportunity. However, we also provide the paper record form for those of you who are used to the Bailey 3. It's going to look very similar. However, you can use the record form in print and still score it and generate a report from the Q Global format. Now, if you were to purchase the Bailey 4 kit, this is what you get. There will be an admin manual that will walk you through how to administer every single item. There's a technical manual that's going to provide a great deal of very useful information about those test and retest features, about how it compares to the Bailey 3 or to the WIPC or perhaps to the uh, motor task, the Peabody. You're going to have information about um, comparisons between normative sample and these different clinical validity groups, and you'll find all of that information in the technical manual, as Glenn Aylward and others have described in the past. There are record forms that are going to uh, look at the cognitive language and motor areas. Now, there are also motor response booklets. There are separate questionnaires that you would give to parents or caregivers to ask them about the child's social, emotional, and adaptive functioning. And after they have done that and you've scored it, you can give a caregiver a report. In addition, of course, there are a stimulus books, uh, observation checklists, and a set of so-called manipulatives. And uh, there are many, many uh, toys, games, and objects within the test kit. And I would encourage you, if you haven't given the test before, open those bags up, become familiar with them. You need to know all about the different types of colors and the different aspects to it so that you'll find that there are form boards that are pink and some are blue. There's a mirror, there's a bell, uh, there are balls, and ducks of different colors, and some uh, ducks are heavy and some are uh, squishable and just become very familiar with everything in there. Uh, so if you are going to administer the items in a digital format, uh, they can be uh, done through an internet-based mobile device or a laptop or PC. And what we're saying is it should be optimized for the screen size of a tablet or larger, so you don't want to try to do this on a small screen. In addition, the social, emotional, and adaptive behavior questionnaires can be administered remotely. Uh, they can be sent uh, to a parent uh, or caregiver to complete, so they don't actually have to be in your office doing that. And if you uh, send them that link, uh, they can be returned to you, and then you'll be able to score them using the Q Global system. Now, what are some of the features for you to be aware of? Well, it does combine the record form and the admin manual in one place. What does that mean? You don't have to worry about, do I have the entire test kit handy? Uh, if somebody else is using it, you can access that information uh, digitally. Uh, it's intended to be nonlinear, non which means, uh, let's say you decide, I'm going to do language first, or perhaps the OT is going to have a go at doing the motor tasks or the PT and then perhaps the speech and language person is going to do those afterwards. You can do that. It's flexible. It lends itself to that approach where you don't have to start off in the order of the record form, but rather you can choose what is uh, going to work for your system or your staff. Now, the screening test, it's important for you to recognize, is only in a paper version, so that's not available in a digital format. 
At this point, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Shelley if you'll come in and describe some of the options that our customers will have if they want to go ahead and buy. Shelley, are you there? Are you there? Yes, thank you, Peter. Um, fabulous. Yeah, that seems a good point to segue over to me. So, um, yeah, so I, I imagine a lot of people have got questions about purchasing options. Um, I am getting lots of questions about the Bailey on all sorts of things, but this is something that comes up quite a lot. So, um, as Peter said, we have it available in paper and digital. And the thing to really understand is that paper and digital are very interchangeable. You don't have to commit to one or the other. And, and I think that's quite a relief for people to hear when they're thinking about um, purchasing the Bailey. You know, do I go digital? Do I go paper? Well, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, think of the paper, the digital administration like a digital record form, and the paper administration is a paper record form. Um, so if you decide to purchase a you know, a, a kit, a paper kit, which comes with 25 administrations of, of each of the of each of the forms then you can just purchase digital usages as well, just like you would purchase rec record forms. Um, both are available. You can either buy a paper kit or a digital kit. They have the same set of manipulatives, the same stimulus manual. They both have separate motor response forms, which are for the fine motor items, which means that you can, again, administer those using digital or paper formats. And I think that's a really important takeaway point. And it's also important, one of the things that we know is that the Digital administration does rely on an internet connection, and there are going to be situations where you may not have an internet connection, so you've got that fallback of being able to use the paper administration. Um, I mean, there are lots of additional advantages of the digital in that it saves time and that it's more efficient to administer, but there are going to be situations where you want to choose one over the other, and you don't have to commit either way to that. Um, other kit options, there is a motor scale kit. This is available as paper only. Um, even though the motor scale can be administered on its own in QGlobal, it, it does it will use a full sort of usage. So it's we've made that available as a paper only, but you can buy the usages um, via QGlobal as well. We also have scoring subscriptions, and sometimes there's a little bit of confusion around the scoring subscriptions. So um, these are basically to support a paper administration. They allow you to manually enter responses from a, a paper administration into the QGlobal platform. They don't allow you to administer it through the QGlobal platform, simply to input the data afterwards. And people like to do that for um, ease of scoring and accurate scoring, for report generation, and so they have the results all stored in a central place as well. And as we said, the screening test is also available as a, as a separate kit option. Um, that will be available in November. It was originally December, but we've brought it forward slightly into November, which is great. Things are, things are moving um, on track and, and ahead of time. So, um, so that will be available as a separate kit option. As we said before, that's only available in, in paper, mainly because it's much simpler to administer. It doesn't have all the um, complexity of the of the full Bailey, so um, it doesn't. You don't get ma major efficiencies from administering it via digital, whereas you do with the full Bailey um, Bailey kit. And then one question I get a lot is, what do I need to upgrade if I'm using Bailey three? Can is there a quick upgrade kit that I can purchase? And actually, it's if you purchase all the items that you need, like the new administration manuals, the record forms. Um, the new manipulatives that have been replaced, it's actually more expensive to buy it um, to buy it uh, separately or individually. So it, it's, it's actually cheaper to buy the full kit. The manipulatives aren't the piece that, that costs a lot. It's all the, the other pieces as well. So, um, so, you know, we've kind of worked it out and, and realized that actually that the kit is the, the cheaper option for you. You can buy the item separately if you want to, but um, most people tend to prefer to go for the full kit. Shelley? And then, yes. yes. Question for you. Could you go back to that slide? Could you go back to that slide? Yes, absolutely. Is it possible to do the, um, let's say, digital administration and buy the admin manual as well? Because sometimes customers just want a paper version of the admin manual. Can you do that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yes, you can. You can. And some um, customers are choosing to do that. There is a digital manual as well, but, you know, I. I like to have a paper manual sometimes to refer to as well. So you can buy a paper manual and still buy the digital administration. So yeah, they're both interchangeable. 
Okay. So I'll just move on to this next slide as well, just to mention as well about training. Um, and we're nearly through to the end. So if people do have questions, if you want to pop them in, I've noticed a few starting to pop up in the chat box, which we'll get to. Um, so just another thing, just to say that training is available. There is free training with kit purchases, an introductory online training piece, which um, gives you an overview of the full Bailey. And I would encourage anybody who, even those who have been administering the Bailey 3 for years, use that go everybody should use that uh, certainly review that overview training it's really good quality and it gives you a lot of information about the changes from baby three to baby four there's also um and i should say as well that free training is available with digital kit purchases or with paper kit purchases or with the motor scale kit purchase as well so it will be provi provided with those there is an additional online independent study program which is 150 dollars and that's so about 12 hours of content. There's a lot of content in that, and it provides detailed item-by-item -item administration and interpretation guidelines um, and you know, all in-depth information that you, you would need to be um, comfortable in administering the Bailey for. And then um, we do have some custom packages as well. I think I wrote customer pack packages on the slide there. I've just noticed that I should say custom packages. Um, and we have in-person training available and webinar training available. These can be full day, half day. And we do have details on the website about those and about pricing options and how we, how we make those available. So you know, just to let people know, training is a question that comes up a lot around Bailey. And, and there are all these options to, to suit your purposes. So I think that was it on the background. So perhaps, Peter, if we want to go to some of the questions that we're getting. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, one question that has come up is, can individual parts be administered separate from the rest? For example, if you only want to do the motor scales, is that possible? It is possible, yes. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. We do have the record forms available separately for paper administration. So you can buy just a paper motor record form or a language record form or the cognitive record form. And, and that was, we had that, that functionality with Bailey 3 as well. And that sort of is there to facilitate an arena type assessment. If you're doing um, digital assessment, the usage that you buy for a digital administration covers all the cognitive language and motor, um, but you can still, that depending on how Q Global is set up in your organization, the hierarchy can be set up so you can transfer that record over to another user. So if, for example, you have an OT or PT, PT doing the motor section, a, a speech and language pathologist doing the, um, doing the language section, you could, move that record over to that other person to administer that other part of the assessment. Or you can just log in and, and sort of administer it as, as, as one, one after the other within, within the system. But you will get individual scores for the individual um, domains or areas that you administer. So yes, that is possible. I think that's answered that question. Yes, it has, Shelley. Uh, here's a different question from somebody today. Uh, she wants to know about communication and language. And I think there was a, a view that perhaps communication and language are separate. Could you address that for her? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, th this question, we've had this question a few times. So, so the, the, the communication part is part of the um, social so the adaptive behavior scale. Sorry, it's automatic for me to say social emotional and adaptive behavior. But part of the adaptive behavior scale, we have a social emotion. Um, excuse me, we have a communication part of that scale. So, um, so that's the adaptive behavior scale is the caregiver questionnaire that's administered to the caregiver um, that they complete. So that's looking at um, communication in practical everyday situations that the child might, might, be, might be in. We also then have the, um, the communication scales on the cognitive language and motor form, and they're split into receptive communication and expressive communication. They then contribute to what we call the language domain so the language domain consists of those two aspects of, of communication. And that, on, on that form, is the directly administered assessment where you're asking the child to 
complete items, your, your um, administering stimulus items and, and observing their responses. So there's two parts to it. There's the, the caregiver part on the adaptive behaviour questionnaire, which has got a communication and um, a communication section. And then there's the part on the directly administered questionnaire as well. So I hope that addresses that question. Yes, it does, Shelley. Uh, here's a different question from Christy today, uh, and I think it's a very good question and one that you would be able to answer. But the question is, did you correlate the Bailey 3 with the Bailey 4? And if so, uh, what is the uh, agreement between the two? And have studies been done on inter-rate reliability and also test-retest uh, with the Bailey 4? And is that found in the technical manual? Thank you. Yes. Yes to all of those. Um, yes, we did a study comparing Bailey 3 to Bailey 4, and the correlations were very, very strong between Bailey 3 and Bailey 4. I can't quote the numbers off the top of my head, but it's all in the technical manual. And again, we did inter-rater reliability um, studies, and those are all detailed in the technical manual, and those are all um, very, very highly um, correlated. The statistics in the Bailey 4 are very, very strong, and they're stronger than they were for Bailey 3. So, um, so yes, we have, we have got all those. I, I just can't quote the numbers off, off the top of my head, but they are all there. Thank you, Shelley. I think you can find them on page 42, table 4.3. And just to emphasize what you're saying, for test retest, there were 152 children. And with the comparison with the Bailey 3, there were 184. And as you pointed out, the correlations between the two were very high. Uh, I think surprising to, to Glenn. Now, a different question that we've got is uh, she wants to know about Q Global. And is there a possibility that an institution uh, could get the Q Global scoring sub a subscription to support the administration of this test? How does that work, please? So the, the, Q, the scoring subscription um, is, it depends how your organization is set up, but it's, it's set up so that you can have a, a hierarchy within your organization but then the scoring subscription is generally per user and that allows you to enter the results for for an unlimited amount of usages over that um that subscription year and it can we make it available as a one three or five year subscription so it is available but we we ha you have to sort of set it up um Q Global has sort of hierarchies that you can set up depending on your, your organizational structure, but the actual subscription part is per user. So the one, three or five year subscription would be per user. I think I, think I addressed the question there, I hope so. If not, please, please, please put some, something else back in the chat box and we'll come back to it. Yes, you did, Shelley. Uh, two questions. One is, how much time should elapse before a child is retested with the Bailey? And a second uh, question is, uh, could you talk a little bit more about the clinical conditions uh, that uh, were given this Bailey scale uh, as a comparison group? Yeah, so, um, yeah, the time, elapsed time is a good question. We, we do get this one quite a lot. Um, so the types of items administered to infants in, in a test such as a Bailey uh, are unlikely to be learned or, or to generate a, a practice effect. So children can be re-administered the Bailey in a much shorter time frame than perhaps some of uh, our more traditional assessments. So um, a, a general sort of guideline, an interval of approximately three months is recommended for children under 12 months of age, and approximately six months is recommended for children older than 12 months. But you can, if it's warranted, um, obviously go with shorter intervals if, if if, if necessary, and I know certainly in some research programs and things, they do go with shorter intervals. So that's our general guideline, and I think it, it, the essence of the, the Bailey is that it, these aren't learned items, they're developmental items, so we don't get those practice effects. And sorry, I, I, I forgot what the second part of the question was, Peter. Well, that's, that, that's fine, Shelley. I was just going to add to that that uh, there are different uh, tasks that are being given to different age groups, right? So if you start with a certain letter, uh, for an age group to establish a basal, you may find that the items you're giving that child differ a great deal from those that you'd give to a child who's older. So your point about three months and six months is very 
helpful because oftentimes school psychologists are asked how often can you repeat a different scale like the Wexler scale and then they were told perhaps a year is the minimum so this is significantly less period of time and I think that's very helpful um, let me come back to uh, what about your suggestion for adjusting for prematurity can you talk about that a little bit particularly for children who may be very premature thank you Shelley yeah, so the Bailey um, does allow for adjustment for prematurity. The guidelines are that a child born at 36 weeks and 6 days or, or less, um, you would adjust for prematurity. And the general guideline is that you would adjust up to 2 years of age. But interestingly, Dr. Elwood has a publication that I think that will be coming out shortly about this, um, about some of his research into prematurity. Um, and when that is available, we'll put the citation on our website um, because I think it will be a useful reference document um, or a certain useful reference article for people. It's not published yet. I know um, he, he shared with me that it will be, um, and I think he's, he's got some interesting commentary. But generally, there are the general guidelines. You, you always have the option not to adjust for prematurity as well. The system defaults to doing that, but you, you, can, you can adjust for prematurity for longer or for less time if, if you wish to do so as well. So you have that entire flexibility. I, I think Glenn Elwood was even suggesting if the child is very, very low birth weight, that would be around 28 weeks or less, since they come into the world much a lower in weight and much earlier than anticipated, a lot of their, let's say, their neurological circuitry is not developed, and so it might be helpful for those children to even go back three years. And I think that was part of the paper that he's writing with Anderson. Isn't that correct, Shelley? Yes, that is correct. You've summarized it perfectly there, Peter. Thank you. A different question today is, what about the full adaptive section? Do you have to do all of it to get a score, or can you get an individual score? Let's say for personal functioning. Yeah, so you do get um, communication, daily living, socialization scores with, with individual scores, but you won't. So to, um, to achieve the communication score, you would need to administer both the receptive and the expressive. For the daily living, you would need to administer the personal section. And for socialization, you would need to administer both the interpersonal relations and play and leisure. But you won't get an overall adaptive score then. And the overall adaptive score is, is generally more robust because there's more items there. Um, but they, you, you can administer um, some of the items and get a, a sort of a more domain level score and, and not get an overall score. So there is some flexibility there, yes, certainly. One of our listeners is also wondering about the caregiver report. Is it possible, Shelley, that there are times when a parent may exaggerate or over-report what a child may do because they're being overly optimistic or perhaps biased? And uh, should clinicians take that into account in reporting results of the adaptive and social-emotional scores? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, so yeah, so, I mean, we, do, we have had this question before. And one of the things when um, we looked in, and certainly we looked at developing the test, um, there's a lot of research, and Dr. Elwood has done a lot of research into this area, um, and to see how caregiver reports might impact on an assessment. And he found that actually um, it, it wasn't impacting on the assessment. It was actually um, supporting the assessment. So when we did the Bailey 4, we looked at the mean scores between those items where we've used the caregiver um, report and then the same items where perhaps we haven't used the caregiver report. And we found that the, there was virtually no difference in the scores. The scores were, were very very much longer uh, in, in support of each other. Um, obviously, there will be situations where you may have a caregiver who, who would perhaps exaggerate or, um, or want to overestimate. And I think that's something you would generally pick up in an assessment session. Um, you know, that's why we have clinicians administering these tests to see if you can pick up any of those things. But in our research and in a lot of the research that Dr. Elwood has done over the years, not just with Bailey 4, but with the Bailey Infant Neuropsychological Screener as well, and Infant Neurodevelopmental Screener, sorry, he, he did a lot of work on this as well. So it's, it's quite a lot of experience here. And the other thing to um, add here is that, you know, 
the caregiver is, is adding to the, the assessment session. Um, there are items in the Bailey that, you know, in a one-to-one -one assessment session, the, there might be a higher incidence of the child refusing to do that item because it's difficult for them. Um, and it's therefore difficult to determine if the child does not or does possess the skill. So the caregiver is there to enhance the session. They are more familiar with the child. They can help bring out those responses. They know, um, they know how the child acts in a typical situation. So, you know, I guess the short answer is no, we don't see any difference between um, by using those caregiver response items. Um, and there's, there's lots of reasons why it's good to include the caregiver in those in the assessment session, and it does strengthen the assessment session as well. So, um, I hope I answered that question. Yes, you did, Shelley. Thank you. Uh, we have a specific question about Q Global. I'm not sure if you'd be the one to do that, uh, but uh, one person wants to know if each therapist gets their own login, or is the login only for the institution? You can, there are different options. So you can have an institution level account and there's quite a lot of information um, on our website about the hierarchies and about setting up the different, the different account options. Um, I can't remember you know, what the exact limit is on how, how it's set up, but you can have a hierarchy so that you can allocate administrations um, between your therapists or clinicians or psychologists, um, whomever within your organization. So that is one of the way that, ways that you can do it, or you can have an individual login as well. So there is that flexibility within the Q Global system, and there's, there's a lot of resources on the website on the Q Global page. Um, I don't have the the information right in front of me, but I know it, there is a piece that talks about the hierarchy and how you can set it up. Shelley, this time a person wants to know about the caregiver questions, uh, in particular. Uh, how would you describe the 2, 1, and 0 scoring? What does that refer to? How do they understand that? Okay, yep, just a minute. So so I guess the, the there's a, a 0 score would be if a child is showing no mastery, no emergence of a skill. Um, an example of a 1 score might be that a child is starting to show that skill, um, that they are partially mastering it. So, and, and that way, it's, the Bailey 4 is more sensitive because you are, you are able to capture those smaller increments of change in, in mastery and emergence of skills. And then a 2 score would be you know, full mastery and emergence of that, that skill. And in the scoring criteria, the scoring criteria does give you guidelines on how to score something as 0, 1, or 2. So it's, it's it's clear when you are administering the test how to score those items as well. So I did have an example. I'm just trying to find it here. So here's an example here. So um, one might be for certain items, you might ask the ask a child to name a familiar object, um, and a two point score might be that they can do that often, they can name all the familiar objects. A one point score might be that they can only do that infrequently or they've just started to do it, maybe they can name one or two familiar objects. And then a zero might be that they can't name any of those objects at all. So it's just sort of showing those gradations of, of responses that you might, you might have. Shelley, this time we have a question about the Vineland 3 manual. Uh, the question is, uh, do I need to purchase the Violin 3 manual to do the adaptive behavior scale on the Bailey? No, you don't. Um, all the information from Violin 3 is in the Bailey 4 manual. Um, and I should also say that it's not all items from the Violin 3 that are included in the Bailey 4. It's a subset of items that are appropriate for the age group of the Bailey 4. So all the information with all the, the data and all the administration directions and everything are included in the Bailey 4 manual, so you don't need to purchase anything else. A different question is about the Bailey 3. Uh, this person wants to know uh, how long those protocols will be available and can people still score and use those? Yep, that's a good question. Yes, they are still available, and generally we make them available for a for some time after a new edition has been published. So um, certainly for a year or two while the demand is there. And one of the things with Bailey is that it's used in a lot of research programs. So there will be longitudinal studies that are ongoing that will be using Bailey 3 and 
forms will continue to be available for those research, research studies. Um, but obviously we know that it's best practice and there's a lot of guidelines from different organizations about the appropriateness of moving on to an updated assessment and, um, and that most professions or most professional organizations suggest you move over to an updated assessment um, as soon as, as, as possible, but we will make them available while there is the demand. And I, I imagine it will certainly be for the next year or year or so or year or two. Shelley, this question is about prematurity. The question is, uh, do uh, people uh, who created the Bailey 4 consider 37 weeks or 38 weeks to be prematurity, or is there some other time period? Yeah, it's um, 36 weeks and six days. So, um, so yeah, um, just under 37 weeks is generally the guideline. Um, but obviously, there will be instances where you might choose to use your clinical judgment in that as well. But generally, that's, that's the guideline when administering the assessment. And Shelley, related to that question would be, what if you can't establish a precise date? What if the, the mother doesn't actually know uh, the day the child should have been born? Uh, is it okay to guess? That is a good question, and I think that depends on your local guidance guidelines as well um, on that. So I think um, usually there's an, an estimate of some sort about when uh, about the the due date. So I think it's a, a kind of um, a, a process of, of investigation and determining um, through all your sources to try and get the closest possible date that you can. Um, but I think the, the, some of that will be down to your local guidelines and, and your local judgments as well. So um, I don't think I can answer any more, um, any more detailed on that question because it's, I, I, it, it's a sort of difficult one to give a definitive answer on. One of the people in the audience would like to know about training. Uh, if they're already familiar with administration and scoring of the Bailey 3, do you think it's imperative for them to get additional training on the 4? And, and what format or, or what types of training is available if a university or a hospital wants to have in-person training? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have, I would say if they're familiar with Bailey 3, then the training that comes free with the kit purchases would be really good training to, to get them up and, move, up and running with, with Bailey 4. Um, and I think you would be fine with that. If you have a large organization and you, you, know, you want to org organize some in-person training, then we do have options for half-day, full-day training on different aspects. So there's, there's actually a flyer on our website that details the training options. If you go to the Bailey 4 program page on, on, on the website and there's a, a tab for training and there's a, there's a flyer on there which, which details those options. But basically you can, um, the half-day ones we, we can, do training on things such as um, administ administration, scoring, interpretation. We can do half-day training on, on more of a brief overview. So there's lots of different packages um, to, that can be tailored for your organizational needs as well. So you know, if you are interested in those, I would suggest you look at that on our website there and speak to one of our um, solutions analysts or, or um, sales consultants, um, assessment consultants, and they will help you figure out which the best option is for you. Um, we also have the in-depth online training as well. So if you are unable to organize a face-to-face -face training, then certainly the online, the in-depth online training, which is about 12 hours of content, which goes through each item by item. It's, it's, it's an enhanced um, training going through all the, all the items in the assessment. And I think certainly for those who are new to the Bailey, then I would, I, I say that would be the, the ideal starting place to go through that training and become familiar with all the items, all the administration um, of, of the Bailey 4. And, and I think that will be a really good, um, good content to sort of get you up and running with Bailey 4. Uh, Shelley, we have a different type of question now. This is more about uh, being a customer. Uh, one person wanted to know if they pre-ordered the test, is it on back order or should they have it by now? And she doesn't say how long ago she ordered it or who she ordered it through, but I think she's wondering, have they already been sent out? 
Okay, yes, they have, but we did, uh, we, our initial stock has all been used and they're making more kits up. So I know there are a few on hold that have come through in the last couple of days, which will be released um, any, day, any day now. I think they've been held for a day or two. So if it was in the last few days, it may well be being held and being built as we speak. Um, if it's a screening test, then that won't be um, released until the screening test is released in November. Um, but if it's longer than that, then I would encourage you to send me an email. My email address is on the screen, and we can try and figure out why um, why that hasn't happened, um, and perhaps there's a hold on it for some reason that I'm unable to answer right right now. But please feel free to email me, and I'll I'll, I'll look into that for you. Shelley, this is on a different subject. Will there be a Spanish version of the test available? I.e., will there be uh, something in Spanish that we can give a caregiver? It's a good question. At the moment, we have no plans for Spanish. We didn't have Spanish with Bailey 3. But it is a question that I'm getting a lot, and I am monitoring. So um, at the moment, we don't have that. There's not enough demand in our, our research indicated prior to, I guess, developing Bailey 4 that there wasn't enough demand for a Spanish version. But um, I'm certainly monitoring, um, monitoring interest and demand for that. So, so right now, no plans. We do. We do work with our international officers, so there will be international versions of Bailey 4 in development. We have no plans for one in, in European Spain at the moment, but sometimes, um, be, mainly because they have a, a European Spanish version of Bailey 3, which um, was only developed a few years ago. But sometimes we look at opportunities with, with working with our Spanish colleagues as well to see if that there is some some opportunities for things that we can do there. But at the moment, we haven't got anything anything in the pipeline. Shelley, one of our uh, listeners today, Leticia, wanted to know if the child refuses to do some task, let's say in the cognition or language area, can you rely on the parent input or parent report uh, in that event? Yes, you can. And that's... Um, it, well, only on those items where you have the, the caregiver option, which is generally on those items where you may well find it difficult to, el to elicit a response from a child. Um, so for the items that have got the structured caregiver questions, then yes, you can rely on the caregiver report for those items. And we've done a lot of work and research to make sure that those, um, it's the correct items where we have the caregiver report. Um, so I imagine that if we, you've got an item that has the potential for that to happen, they will be the, the items that will have the structured caregiver questions. So you should be able to elicit that information. Shelley, Shari has a similar question, which is, uh, do you rely on the direct administration score or the score from the caregiver? Which one? So. Um, it would be the score from the caregiver on those caregiver elicited um, questions. So you you would rely on that um, when you're interpreting the scores. That's what they're there for to support the administration and the and the scoring. So um, yeah, um, you should be able to use those scores to to determine the response. Shelley, um, Lauren wants to know if we're going to have training DVDs available. Will that be part of the uh, future training? Uh, plans for the Bailey? No, we haven't got the training DVDs, but we have the online training, which is a replacement for the training DVDs. So the other thing with the online training is that once you have access, you have your, your access isn't time restricted. So it will be there for you to dip in and out of um, when you want to. So if you, if you purchase the online training, then you, you can go back at any point and review the content on that on that package. So it's it's an alternative for the um, for the DVD that we had previously. Shelley, uh, Leticia has a different question, and that is, would it be possible to have an interpreter present if the child is not English speaking or if their parents aren't? Uh, and would that be a possible alternative? Yeah, we do have a section in the manual about administering um, with different populations. So um, in the appendix, I believe it's in the appendix of the technical manual, or it might be the administration manual, there is some guidelines on um, administering in non-standardized um, ways. Um, but there's, there's, very, there's, there's some information there on, 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 on 
sort of non-standard administration. We're also looking at doing a webinar early next year. Um, at the moment, we're looking at the, the possibility of doing a webinar and including Bailey in that for um, you, using an inter interpreter for administration. The thing you should remember with Bailey, though, is that it has been developed with English language speaking children in mind. So that's one of the big issues here. So if you are going to use it in that way, it would be considered a non-standard administration and that you would have to interpret it accordingly. So um, so we are looking to provide some more information on that, um, but it, it won't necessarily, it would still mean that you have to use the data and the, the information with caution because it's developed on, on an English speaking population. Shelley, we're almost out of all the questions that have been asked, but the audience has been great at putting those questions in the chat box. I think we may have time for one or two more. Uh, one person wants to know if we're aware of any programs currently using the Bailey 4, and I'm not sure that uh, you'd be able to answer that question, but uh, um, somebody does want to know, uh, is it being used already? Yes, I mean, it, it was published two weeks ago, so it will be being used as uh, there's lots of people out there using it, but we're obviously not able to provide the information as to who is using it for um, data security, data protection reasons, obviously. So, um, but Bailey 4 is a very, very widely used test. Um, it's a gold standard in terms of monitoring in the development of infants and toddlers. It's used worldwide. Um, we we have the US version just published. We have an Australian version in development, which will, will be published early next year. We have a, a validation happening in the UK for the UK population, and we had validation for the UK with the Bailey 3 as well. We also have a French version in the pipeline and other Scandinavian, uh, other European versions with Scandinavian countries, including Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. and. Um, I believe there's some others as well that will happen. So in terms of its use, it's very widely, widely used around the world, not just in, in North America as well. So we, we, um, we, we know that it's, it's, it's a very well used assessment and certainly used in a lot of um, research studies as well and longitudinal research studies. So I hope that addresses Actually, that I'd question. I'd agree with that because I, I, went, to, uh, because I went to a a site in uh, Czechoslovakia where uh, we had people from Australia, Spain, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, all very interested in how they can begin to administer and score the test in a pharmaceutical trial. So I absolutely concur with what you're saying. Uh, it is considered to be uh, the uh, test. Um, and Hisela again is asking the question, uh, about whether a Spanish version is in development uh, because uh, there is a question about whether um, that can be used with um, a certain uh, parent group. And I think that's the last question we'll be able to take today, Shelley. Thank you. Yeah, just to say that there, there isn't a Spanish version in development at the moment, but I am monitoring that. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to produce a Spanish version, but um, it's certainly a question I'm, I've been asked a, a few times, So, um, but no plans at the moment. And I think that's thank it. Thank you very and much, I think we're, we're out of time. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, everybody, for listening today. If there's any questions we didn't get to, please feel free to email me on the address, email address on the screen. And um, thank you for your time and your excellent questions.